So I figure because I have this whole spread just laid out for you guys already on the kitchen counter, um, I figured I'd do it in here, do the tomato test in here rather than doing it outside. It's just a lot of work. I have a lot of things to do <laughs> other than just eat tomatoes all day. So we're gonna do this taste test in here um, I hope no one minds. The only downside is that the light isn't, isn't great, but it is what it is. So we're going to taste today, I don't know, at least probably about 15 different varieties of tomatoes. And these are all grown here in uh, my Philadelphia area backyard. And it's, you know what? The tomatoes um, this year have been quite impressive. Um, we have a lot of production this year in such a very small space. I'm growing about 50 tomato plants, 50 tomato varieties in a 10 by 17 foot area. So that's 170 square feet, but it's even less than that. It's probably half um, because a big portion of it was dedicated to melons and a big portion of it was dedicated to pepper plants and eggplants and tomatillos. We even have an herb section of that area. So there's a lot of tomato plants very closely packed in. And if you're interested in how I'm growing these tomatoes, let me know down in the comments because I'll show you guys my techniques. I think it's uh, really just so simple. A lot of commercial growers do it like this where they grow their plants vertically. So we've been having some pretty good weather as of late. Um, it's been raining. You know, as just, it always does in, in August, it rains uh, in the Philadelphia area. But in the last week or so, it's been relatively dry. So I think this kind of really helps the tomatoes and maybe will concentrate their flavor a bit. That's what I'm really hoping for is that we're not, um, you know, doing this taste test on a day where it was just raining a ton. In fact, it's gonna rain today and tomorrow and the next day. So I've decided let's pick many of these, make them in the sauce, get an evaluation of them and that's what we're doing so i've i did do a taste test video by the way guys quite recently and we tasted a number of tomatoes like this one here is called persuasion this is a brad gates tomato it's extremely beautiful we also tasted something uh right here called goose creek we taught we tasted this pink berkeley tie-dye we had some pretty good tomatoes but Really was nothing that impressive compared to my favorite, at least fresh eating tomato, that's a big beefsteak like this called Pink Brandywine. Um, so I think what we're really trying to accomplish out of this is not just grow a huge variety of tomatoes. I think that's nice, I think that's great, but this whole trial, the purpose of it was to try to find something better than the rest, better than my four favorite tomatoes. and. My current favorite, as I said, is pink brandy wine. I really like the sud of the strain. You can find seeds of that pretty much anywhere, but here it is right here, actually. Really solid tomato. Um, it's got great flavor, great texture. It's got everything you want, basically, um, in a big beefsteak tomato. Uh, my next favorite is called Green Zebra. And green zebra is just um, the most acidic tomato you could think of. And I have a tomato here called uh, Michael Pollan. It was named after Michael Pollan, the writer and the uh, food person. I guess you could call him that. Uh, this one I think was bred with, uh, if I'm not mistaken, green zebra in the genetics, but it's extremely different as I've heard and as I've read. So green zebra though is very acidic and that's why I really like it. My absolute favorite cherry tomato is the, the black cherry here. And in here, because I decided to try to find something better than black cherry, um, I'm also growing Reinhardt's Purple Craft, I think it's called, Reinhardt's Purple. And then also another one in here, um, uh, the name's escaping me right now. There's so many tomatoes, but Oh, it's called black opal, right? So this is a mix of them and I should be able to differentiate really just purely based on the size of which is which. They're actually pretty stark differences in size between the three. 
Um, we also have one of my favorites in terms of paste tomatoes because, you know, a lot of these are paste tomatoes, guys. Um, I'm not going to be eating them fresh, although maybe a lot of you guys would like me to taste them. A lot of these here, like Pianola de Vesuvio and Osta Valley and um, the Grimpoli di Inverno. We even have the Ten Fingers of, Fingers of Naples. We have San Marzano, Fiaschetto de Madura. Uh, more of this uh, Principe de Borghese. We have the Purple Russian. We have Fuego Verde. But that was all in an effort really to try to find my favorite paste tomato. And this one here is Orange Banana, which is my favorite. Historically, it's been my favorite. Amy Goldman talks a lot about it in her books. Um, I've seen it in different writings. And a lot of people just, I think, oddly enough, agree. And as I tasted that with that sauce, it really doesn't make a fantastic, fantastic sauce. So for me, orange banana is king. Um, and hopefully we can find something that's better. You know, that's the goal of this whole thing here. So even though I'm not going to try all these today fresh and eat all these fresh, we're going to at some point um, make them all into sauce very, very soon. And then in a separate video, I will have you know, hopefully 20 different batches of sauce made specifically with that one tomato. Uh, and we will find out what makes the best tomato. I'm even going to do a mix. We're going to mix in a lot of these because whatever I don't eat today, as I said, is going to go into a batch of sauce. So I'll mix them all up and we'll have ourselves just a general heirloom tomato sauce. You know, a, a, a tomato sauce that's per made of purple Russian, a tomato sauce that's made of orange banana and, and so forth. So. That's our plans. That's our future videos coming out. Hopefully you guys are interested uh, and we'll see you there. So the first one I really, really want to try is this white tomato here. It's called white tomasol. I've heard good things about this and I've heard bad things about this. I think it's very difficult to determine when this thing is ripe. So I'm going to choose the softest one and I'm going to eat that one. These two here seem relatively soft. I think they're really striking. I mean, it's so easy to like spot these out. If you just look at all of the, uh, if you look at my table here, it really is striking compared to the rest. So, and I've never even eaten a white tomato before. A lot of people give them crap. There's a bad rap on them. This one seems to have a great reputation. Uh, actually kind of mixed reviews I've heard. That's very good. Wow. Yeah. That's a very good tomato. So usually the, um, you know, the, the color of the tomatoes, we're going to talk a lot about this today. When we tried this, these cherry tomatoes, we tried the, uh, the beef steak and the salad type tomatoes. The color really determines the flavor. So it's like that really a lot of fruits. Now, just because a tomato is green doesn't mean it's acidic, right? Just because a tomato is white means it has to have a certain flavor. But usually, more on average, if you have a certain color in a particular fruit or vegetable, it usually corresponds to a specific flavor, right? And in figs, as an example, usually the red interior figs uh, taste like berries, you know? And there could be a wide range of that berry flavor. Um, a lot of the brown or amber interior figs maybe tastes a bit like figs or actually a bit like honey or melons. So, you know, you get a, a wide variety of flavors just based on these colors. And that's not, you know, we're not growing these tomatoes here for looks, by the way. I didn't pick and choose these tomatoes because I thought they looked great, right? And that's honestly what some of these tomatoes are to me, is that uh, unfortunately after eating them and tasting them, to me they all ended up being looks and no talk. You know what I mean? The flavor wasn't there. What we're doing here is we're determining the best flavor and the best texture of these tomatoes to replace or grow alongside my favorites. So if it looks great, you know, that's awesome, but it's, it could be a work of art. Like this, this persuasion tomato really is a work of art. I mean, this is just striking, but I'll tell you, it doesn't necessarily matter to me. Um, I'd rather have it taste good than look good. 
This tomato here is quite fruity. It's a little chalky. It reminds me a lot of a pink brandy wine that's a bit fruity. It has a, a decent texture to it. The shell's a bit more tough. Um, and it has a really interesting tomato-y aftertaste flavor that really lasts on your tongue, lasts on your palate. It's sweet, but it's also balanced. This is a very, very good tomato. I'm gonna save this on the side here because I wanna eat this again and compare it to some of the better tomatoes that we're gonna try today. Now, as I said, this, these yellow ones or these white tomatoes really have a flavor that is, as I said, a lot like, or, or it has a corresponds to a particular flavor, but I don't really know what that flavor is for these white tomatoes. This is really brand new, and I would say they're kind of just fruity. So right here, we have a Brad Gates tomato called Barry's Crazy Cherry, and this is very similarly colored to that white Tomasol. And if I eat this, I should expect a similar flavor, right? Uh, by the way, these tomatoes, these cherry tomatoes here, Barry's Crazy Cherry, are crazy. I mean, they look wild. I think this is such a cool plant. Uh, no wonder people kind of got really into this plant or into this variety. That's very good. Again, very fruity. Maybe I'm just biased towards these white tomatoes here. Here's another one called, um, oh man, oh, this is Napa Chardonnay. And I had actually been such in love with this tomato that I did a separate video just on this, recommending it. So this is a very good tomato. And it does remind me a lot of this various crazy cherry, but I think it's better. I think it's definitely significantly better. There's some nice acidity and well-balanced flavors. Let me try the various crazy cherry again. They're both very good, different in their own little way. But if I had to put my money on it, I say the Napa Chardonnay is, um, it's quite good and it's better. I like the texture on it. I like the balance of acidity, the flavors in it. It's just very, very good. So yeah, I highly recommend these white tomatoes. I mean, so far the three that I've grown, they're all very, very good. And that's, uh, I think saying something there, this tomato right in front of me, I might as well just go for this cause I am. Curious, this is called Rose and it's not Rose, or at least I don't think it's Rose because Rose is supposed to be rose colored <laughs> or a pink tomato and it's orange. Um, it's quite soft, we're having a problem here. So it's definitely very ripe and I had to pick it. But the problem is some of my tomato plants as dense as I'm growing them, oh wow, look at that. The inside is very rose. The outside is kind of orange or yellow, but the inside is quite pink. It's tough to get, kind of looks like a tomato that you might grow from like Rutgers or something, <laughs> which is not good. Not a good quality. Um, let's try it. Pretty weird and um, grainy, really just not good. Um, and I don't think this is a really fair judgment on this tomato, so I'm gonna hold judgment on this variety. Because I don't think it really w uh, ripened well at all. And what I know about Rose is that this should be a much higher quality tomato than, than this. And so far, this is just basically your average you know, hybrid tomato that was bred by Rutgers <laughs> and uh, it's just not very good. You know, it doesn't have uh, qualities to me that scream, oh, this is a good tomato. And you can really tell by the texture, you know, those grainy store-bought grocery store tomatoes, they're just disgusting. Um, all right, so let's continue on here. What, what do we wanna try next? This here is the Black Beauty. And I tried this on video, two years ago, 
we did a taste test two years ago, but this tomato guys is not very black. And the reason again, as I just stated with the rose is that these tomatoes are quite shaded at this point. And I think that lack of sunlight hitting these tomatoes because I grow them so densely, you know, each tomato plant, it gets one square foot. So this tomato is just not black. But in years past, when I had grown it, using the same seeds that I, I used for this tomato, um, it was indeed very dark and quite an impressive tomato. The inside looks similar to what I remember. And what I recall from eating this was it was like eating a tomato that was injected with fennel seed. Um, like a licorice type flavor in this. Yeah, it still kind of does have that licorice flavor in there. Wow. Um, by the way, I have some fennel seed right next to me that I'm going to put on the stove. I may even roast or um, dry some. This is a very good tomato. It has just an interesting flavor to it. And I think a lot of people agree. Yeah, I mean, there is just like a very distinct herbal flavor in there. And to me, it screams fennel. Um, not exactly so licorice-like that people who don't like licorice or don't like fennel wouldn't enjoy it. It's very subtle. Um, the skin's a bit tough. I don't like the skin. The texture on the inside is smooth and it's pretty good. Um, but for my money, um, it's not my favorite. And I said that two years ago and um, it's good, but it's just not my favorite. And it gets a lot of points for different reasons. Specifically, it's, it's beauty. I mean, it's and the fact that it's a black tomato, that herbal flavor is definitely very interesting and um, it's worth looking into. This here is Paul Robeson, so we're going to continue on with kind of the disappointing, weird looking tomatoes because they just don't look right. Um, this Paul Robeson is brown with a green top, and I think Paul Robeson's supposed to be a purple or black tomato. Not as dark as the uh, Black Beauty, but this particular tomato, um, I've, noticed, I've noticed in the past, and I've grown this thing in the past, and it's never really looking like, it doesn't really have the colors that I ever see in the catalogs or on the nursery websites. It just doesn't never really looked right. And I think the reason for that is not necessarily in the seeds, um, I think it has a lot to do with the fact that this is just shaded, once again, is that the plants are not really getting the light that they need to fully express the full uh, colors in the skin. Maybe it, it could be a nutritional problem, but you could see the inside. And and these are very small, by the way. Some of my plants, admittedly, are just not very healthy, so that could be very much so impacting the flavor, impacting my experience. I mean, that's very good. It's quite earthy. It really tastes like grass. <laughs> I don't mean weed. I mean talking about like, like a very greeny, has a very green flavor to it. Like a very vegetable, vegetable-like flavor to it smooth great balance it's got good sugar content it's a good tomato again it just doesn't beat the pink brandy wine for me it just doesn't all right let's move on let's try this michael pollen tomato this one i think has really good keeping abilities so you could harvest this or Get it, get it off the vine and you could let it sit inside for a bit and it'll store for a very long time. You could really tell, I think, just how thick these walls are and it almost reminds me of like a paste tomato. Looking at it on the inside, 
it looks like a paste tomato. Um, and the walls are so thick. There's very little juice. There's very little pulp. I feel like this could be just something I make in a sauce rather than eating it fresh. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty good, but it's not something I think I'd eat fresh. This is like, if I had no tomatoes and I was like in the winter time and these were my only option for a fresh tomato because they store so long, I think it'd be a good option. But I'm gonna make this into sauce, I think. I'm gonna try making this into sauce, its own little batch. I think that's really what that's for, personally. Um, sorry, Michael Pollan, your tomato kinda sucks. <laughs> um, all right. <laughs> so, let's try this one here. Right in the front, I have uh, some black Cherokee. And these are not really perfectly, perfectly ripe, I think. But this is like as good as it gets in terms of a black or purple tomato. And that a lot of people choose this one or black crim or some other black tomato like the Paul Robeson. I mean, look how different the Paul Robeson looks. It doesn't look anything alike. And I've always thought that Paul Robeson should look a lot like this black Cherokee, but it doesn't. This is like brown, almost orange. And then this is just pink. A little bit of red down here and there's some darker purple or black colors at the top. So, yeah, I mean, weird. But this should be really, really impressive. Absolutely, but you know what? It really isn't uh, more impressive, I think, than the Black Beauty. And it isn't even more impressive than the Paul Robeson. So maybe I need to wait, really reserve judgment, let these guys hang for a little bit longer. I grew Cherokee Purple like four or five years ago, and it was really, really impressive. The vines looked great. They were really good producers for an heirloom and they produced all season. Um, but I, I grew pink brandywine right next to them and the pink brandywine just beat it every single time. So I've always just stuck with over the years um, growing pink brandywine. And yeah, I would grow black crim here and there and things like that, but I didn't grow Cherokee purple since because of that. So, all right, let me try another one here. I really want to try this tomato. It's called Goose Creek. We tried it in the last one. This is a very, very impressive tomato. People have been recommending it to me. I don't know how I've heard about this. Yeah, that's exactly what these are. Both of these are Goose Creek. And they are kind of like a pink brandywine alternative. So I've been growing not just different tomatoes to try to beat it or maybe have something that's a little bit different, but actually something that's so similar like this Goose Creek that maybe it'll produce more fruits, better tasting fruits, have some sort of edge uh, production wise and flavor wise over the pink brandywine. And so far it has a clear distinct advantage over the production um, and the earliness. Whoa. That's got some really intense tomato flavor. Holy crap. Wow. That's the most intense tomato I've had so far. Wow. Um, personally, I think this is really good. Is it a pink brandywine replacement? I don't think so. But let me try this pink brandywine. I have a couple over here that are similar-ish. Not really, but they look similar. 
One of these is Pantano Romanesco. And then I also have Pink Brandywine. And I have a couple of these that are unlabeled. I brought them in the house and didn't label them and forgot what they were. And they look so darn similar. And then I think this one here is not Soldaki. We have Soldaki here. We have a Pantano Romanesco for sure. And then I think maybe two of these are Pantano Romanesco. We'll find out. I think it's possible, but one of these could be a carbon. Um, so let me see if I taste any differences between these three. And we're going to compare that to the Goose Creek. This, I believe, right here, this tomato, I have a hunch, is the pink brandy one. So we'll f we'll, we're going to find out right now. Certainly looks like it. I love these pink tomatoes. Yeah, I think that's it. The way I can really tell about a pink brandy wine versus other tomatoes, there's a really good chalkiness to it, a richness within the tomato that, again, is just very chalky. And I know that sounds weird, but I'm sure some of you uh, out there know what I'm talking about. Yeah, this is a totally different tomato than the pink brandy wine. Cut that weird piece out. By the way, I want to taste this pink brandy wine again, side by side of this this uh, white tomasol. I know, they're both very good. Both very good. I don't know what this is, but this could be the uh, Pantano or it could be Carbon, right? Pantano Romanesco, I think is the name. All right, let's try this. It's kind of watered down, this, this one. Watered down flavor. Yeah, really not that uh, interesting or complex at all. This one here, I'll try this. This I think is the same exact thing as what I just ate. Yeah, I mean, I have, this is what I would imagine. This one's a little better. These guys must have really liked to suck up that water. Let me try the Pantano Romanesco just in case. This is something that I want to get a handle on here. Yeah, this is very different. So I think these two here are carbon. I don't even think they are carbon. I think they're kind of mislabeled. I don't know what they are. This Pantano Romanesco is very good. Still not on the level of that pink brandy wine. So out of all the tomatoes that we've tried so far today, I want to rank them so far. We have pink brandy wine one, white tomasol two, um, then I have Black Beauty 3, Paul Robeson 4, per Cherokee Purple 5, and then number 6, uh, from other videos, not from this particular video, I would put this pink Berkeley tie-dye. Because we tried, oh wait, I forgot about Goose Creek. Because we tried uh, Persuasion, Goose Creek, and uh, the Soldaki in a different video. Goose Creek was the best of that video, but Pink Berkeley tie-dye was, I think, behind it. So 
I'd probably put Goose Creek. Let's try Goose Creek again. I'm gonna put Goose Creek three, Wait Tomasol two, and then everything goes down a step. We have one more here of the beef steaks to try. It's called African Queen. This one seems a little bit, a little bit uh, more firm than maybe I would like it to be. Another pink or red beef steak tomato. Yeah, I'm not that impressed. I think I'm gonna reserve judgment on that one. Just like I reserve judgment on Rose. Um, this may just need to ripen longer, I, I don't know. And the flavor just is, is kind of there, but it seems pretty, you know, average to me. All right, so let's try some of these cherry tomatoes, that's really all we have left. And then we're done. We did the Napa Chardonnay, we did the Barry's Crazy Cherry. Um, I'm gonna try a couple of these. Here's a, I think this one's called Green Bee. Green Bumblebee or something like that. What's interesting about this tomato is that it's so firm. And they say that because it's such a firm tomato is that it really holds its shape well when you cook with it. It's a very good tomato to cook with. So I don't even know if I want to eat this because it seems rock hard at this point. But I know they're right because you can tell by the color when it came right off the vine. Let's try it. Wow. Always extremely interesting. Sweet. Slightly acidic, but they're right. It's uh, it's all in that texture for this one. This is the crunchiest tomato I've ever eaten. Hmm. Now, that's almost as crunchy as an apple. That's pretty strange. So I'm kind of weirded out right now. I don't know what to think. But certainly for a chef, I could see this one being something where it's growing. Let's try the Principe. These are supposed to be sauce tomatoes, but... Mm. That's got some good flavor to it. A lot of good tomato flavor. This one here, I'm blanking on the name. I think it's called uh, Lucky Tiger. And I'm gonna cut this open. Let's see the inside of it. This could be a paste tomato, I just really don't recall. It's a very interesting bicolor tomato. Let's try it. Very strange, very good flavor. Complex and very fruity. Let's try this Frank's Iranian. I'm gonna cut these open. I've eaten so many tomatoes right now that I think I need to, I need to chill. Oh, this is an interesting, look at that interior. Ooh. That's beautiful. It's definitely for sauce. Wow. I think that one has a lot of potential to it. Holy crap. The Sunrise Bumblebee, personally, I think is all looks, no flavor. It's just kind of your average cherry tomato in terms of flavor. It's beautiful. Yeah, 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 yeah. Whatever. Not a huge fan. This Risentrop, I've eaten this so many times. 
And I think this one also is just average, whatever, bland tomato. I don't know why people grow it, to be honest with you. Um, it's not impressive, even in the slightest bit. Yeah, no, it's a little harsh, but we're going to try making that in a sauce and see if you can salvage it, because I don't think I'm ever going to grow it again. Um, let's see here. We have the Osta Valley. I don't really want to eat these. I think they're just really for this particular purpose of making them in the sauce. So I'm going to hold, I'm going to reserve judgment till another day, I think, in terms of eating them fresh. This pink vernissage is really quite bland. The texture's wrong. Yeah, it's beautiful. I mean, look at the stripes on it. It's really not good. Um, Fuego Verde, I did try this and this was quite impressive fresh but we are gonna save this one for sauce. And like most of these, that's kind of their main purpose, right? Although these might look like cherry tomatoes, they're really not, that's not what they're for. Here's the uh, Gardner Sweetheart. This one has a long hang time on the vine. You can sell them as clusters on the vine. That's how interesting they can be. Yeah, oh, that's like a store-bought cherry tomato in every way in terms of the flavor. Not very good. Holy crap. But, you know, it has its purpose. And maybe if I dried them, as some of these tomatoes, I probably will try uh, experimenting with as well as turning them into, um, you know, raisins sun-dried tomatoes in a sense, and then taking those dried tomatoes, putting them in olive oil, maybe some herbs. Let me show you guys these. These are just fantastic. These California sun-dried tomatoes in olive oil. These are incredible. So if I can make these at home, it's oils, onion, garlic, spices, salt, and other crap. So you can do this at home.